Thank you, Gabriela. Thank you for the, the invitation. Thank you all for coming. And uh, thank Glenn for the amazing work he does with Language of Liberty. It's a pleasure to be in one more uh, chapter of this event. And um, so I guess it's good that I come after uh, Edu because it can be a little more optimistic than he is. <laughs> you guys um, I do think that technology is um, not of course, uh, uh, always uh, uh, freedom increasing or freedom maximizing, but I do think that in general is freedom biased, and I think that's uh, good enough for us to celebrate our technological progress. But I also think that comes uh, with problems, and problems we have to, to face and, and, and think about them. And today I would like to discuss three of these problems. Uh, the first one is how technology changes work and, and capital. So the economic consequences of technological progress and, uh, and digital technologies. The second, how technology allows us to have um, greater discussions and also uh, to have more time and, and capacity to articulate ourselves and the political consequences of that. And finally, how technology changes institutions. And I will try to convince you, usually for the better. Um, so, first, what does Trotsky and the PC have in common with the personal computer? Um, and, truly, uh, communism, and, and especially the way that uh, Marxists and Trotsky saw them, and the, the PC, the uh, first club, um, they share something in common. They both promise to deliver mankind, humankind, from uh, economic servitude. Right? They both say that, well, if you have communism, in case of Trotsky, or uh, computation, in case of uh, the innovators in the, from the 70s on, then we can free people from the shackles of everyday labor, from age-old toil. Right? Trotsky thought that you would uh, wake up in the morning and just go get the cow and then uh, fish in the evening and write poems in, in the afternoon. Um, and some people said that probably he never milked the cow before because you cannot just walk to a cow and you know ask them, can you give me some milk, right? <laughs> but um, in any case, the PC also promised us that we could have a much more efficient way to do uh, work and labor, and computer would do that for us, so we could have free times to uh, also develop our own uh, meaningful activities. And neither of those promises, of course, came true, but one came more true than the other. Uh, one led to slave labor camps, the other one led to uh, increasing uh, 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 economic progress. Uh, but both of them promised a leisure utopia. And that is something that mankind has been pursuing for a long time. It's nothing new to the 20th century. If you read Aristotle, you see that in politics he says that if every instrument could accomplish its own work, obeying or anticipating the will of others, the shuttle could weave and the plectrum touch off the, uh, the lyre without a hand to guide them, chief workmen would not want servants nor master slaves. So though Aristotle is famous for uh, defending slavery, he thought that, well, if we have certain economic conditions, if we have this automation utopia, then we would not need slaves anymore, we would not need servants anymore, right? And we've never came so close to fulfilling Aristotle's uh, uh, utopia as uh, we are today, right? 20 years ago, um, in 1994, I remember that uh, one of my good friends followed me. It was, it was actually like last, last month, it made 20 years ago, in 1994. He called me saying, well, I got a new computer. It was like, I don't know, like a 482 DX2, something like this, right? You know, it's super powerful. It has like 500 mega of RAM you know, of uh, uh, hard disk. It was amazing. And we were like, you know, looking at the computer. This was before the internet, so all you could do is like watch screensavers on, on the screen. Um, but he, his father gave to him for his birthday, and he also gave a sticker. And on that sticker said, not even the greatest computer can beat a human in the game of chess. It's like, wow. Like, don't, don't uh, overestimate this machine because we are still going to beat them uh, when we play chess. Of course, three years later, that sticker was uh, not uh, uh, confirmed because uh, of the, the conference between uh, Tiplo and Kasparov. But we 
still always thought that, well, but there are some realms where computers cannot uh, beat us that are intrinsically human. Uh, so in 2004, um, uh, a book was predicting, of, of two of computer scientists were predicting the kind of work that the computer could do and the kind of work that only humans could do. And they thought that complex pattern recognition was inherently human. Right? So they thought, and this is the example they chose. So driving, for instance, like driving is something only people can do because you need to uh, convert a bunch of information that uh, is, is not uh, linearly aligned. So you have to actually uh, work with your uh, evolved sense of, of perception to recognize all these different patterns. Of course, today, this is a new reality we have. Google cars driving miles and miles without ever getting a fine, which can be a problem for, you know, city halls in Brazil. If <laughs> Google cars don't, don't get fined anymore, you know, what's going to happen with the city revenues? Um, but we see that more and more computers can do things that humans were uh, able to do. And the Economist even published in, in, in January a feature study saying that 40% of uh, human occupations might be, and some have a very slight chance, but might be uh, uh, replaced by, by computers. So, of course, they got this number wrong, because we always get these kind of things wrong, but the trend might be right. right? So, more and more, we have uh, the, the fulfillment of what Ursula was saying. We have uh, textile uh, printers that are like, you know, weaving. Uh, without any kind of human labor, just obeying commands. We have uh, software that can anticipate our will. I do think that Pandora knows better what I like than what I like myself. Right? <laughs> it's, it's kind of amazing sometimes. Um, and, and Liar is only one of the 450 uh, characteristics that Pandora takes into account in its music coach and all. Um, so we're working closer to what, uh, we're moving closer to what Aristotle uh, envisioned. But many people are pessimistic about this, and they say, well, there is a destructive side to this creative destruction. And uh, a few of them, maybe, maybe some of the more famous in um, the public conversation, uh, even if they're from the left or they are more uh, liberal or libertarian, they still uh, agree that there is a problem that should be addressed. So PBT is the famous uh, French economist that everyone started to love, and his basic thesis is that Nepal is going to uh, become uh, more severe because the rate of return on capital will be greater than the average growth in the next century. Krugman kind of agrees with, with uh, Piketty, and he thinks that the new technological disruptions are capital biased, so they reward capital more than they reward uh, labor. Tanya Kao, in, in his book, uh, Average is Over, thinks he's an optimist in the long run, but he thinks in the short uh, run, not short run, short run, uh, we're going to see a decline of medium productivity because uh, technology rewards uh, fewer people and more people get displaced because of technology, something that a Brigitte Sol Bryn Schaufson, I am never able to say his name. Uh, Bryn and McAfee agree. Uh, so they think that technology, it doesn't necessarily reward capital, but does reward uh, qualified uh, labor. So people who have skills are able to work with technology, and those who don't lose their jobs to new technology. So they all see that there are problems that could be addressed. I mean, of course, Calvin and, and Breed and McAfee are more optimistic about technology, but they do uh, agree that there are going to be some losers. Now, what we do about this, right? Because they say that we're going to have more losers and fewer winners, which is a prediction that comes from Ricardo and Marx and many others who divide economic production into at least three factors, uh, land, labor, and, and capital, and say, well, if one of these factors is more rewarded than the others, then we're going to have some kind of inequality because those who reap the rewards are going to be fewer and fewer and concentrated on one factor of production. What uh, I think is one of their mistakes is that they think, 
for some reason this is more Marxian than, than Ricardo, that the main problem is that labor uh, is going to lose and that means that workers in the world, because they are a majority, are going to suffer. Um, and what they get wrong is that they have this idea that human, that mankind is condemned to labor, that we cannot survive without toil. Um, so, it's like if we have two myths, they choose the myth of Sisyphus, right? They think, and this is something that Bastia used to say, Sisyphism, they think that labor must be preserved. That means you have to curb technology or you have to punish capital in order to reward labor. But the other myth, uh, I mean, the other way you can think about humankind is more like Atlas. So it's more like not necessarily uh, a continuous labor or a labor as an end in itself, but some kind of self-enhancement that can come from labor or can come from other sources as well. So instead of saying that mankind must be divided between either labor or technology and capital, um, there is another uh, vision, which is well, labor, technology, and capital, they can all work for the benefit of mankind, for the benefit of all. Um, and this is an important distinction. Because either you punish capital, which means you actually punish society and even laborers, because when you punish capital, that means that production in society as a general, in general loses, um, or you curb technology, which is worse. And uh, like Edward Prescott, for instance, thinks that the, the most harmful way that rent seeking and political activities uh, uh, punish society is exactly by curbing technologies. So you want to preserve labor and you don't allow technologies that would, would actually enrich human lives. So the, the thing is that we're still in prison inside this Sisyphism, as, as Bastia calls it, or homo proletarius. Like we do think that mankind was born to toil and that is a necessary feature of any society. Uh, but I want to suggest we think more about human impresarius, which is the way that Ludwig von Mises talks about economic production. Not being material, but being mainly spiritual. I mean, or psychological, if like, maybe he, if he was right today, he would use uh, another term. But basically, what it means is that humans are agents of changes and of progress and of wealth creation. And it doesn't really matter which means you're using as long as you recognize that that is how uh, societies evolve and prosper. But that changes the perception that we have of society because if you don't think that labor, um, or as Aristotle would call productive labor, or, or Adam Smith would also make this distinction, is necessary to mankind, then you don't have to imprison mankind with uh, unnecessary occupations. So how do you rethink that? Well, if, for instance, if Piketty is right, and maybe Freud is not, but if Piketty is right and Krugman are right, that does not mean that you have to punish capital. It just means you have to give more access to capital for the poor, right? And usually they are against those kind of measures, which is mind-boggling. But if you think about it, if capital is benefiting mankind, then you want to have more economic inclusion. It means you won't have mass consumption that reaches the masses, which is exactly how uh, uh, capitalism operates. But you also want to have more proper entitlement. Something that in Rio has been done in Morro Cantagallo, in Sao Paulo, in Osasco. But uh, this line of thought that was led by Hernando de Soto about uh, making that capital alive it means uh, the poor have capital de facto, but they do not have capital by uh, legislation, uh, the juries, they don't, not, they don't have the property, so they cannot change the fact of capital into economic capital, into economic resources. So these kind of changes allow the poor to actually benefit from, from uh, capital. Uh, and to give more access to, to capital itself, which means that you don't want to have so many barriers and obstacles for the poor to have uh, access to the um, the financial system uh, to get credit. I, I, I don't mean you want to create artificial credit, but you want to remove these barriers. Uh, and also have more capitalist education. So when you look at computers playing chess, computers can be humans, but usually they cannot be, be a human with a computer. So you have a human-computer team, that's usually the best combination. 
And if you think about it, one of the bad things we do about education is that we are not giving our, especially our, our, our poor children, uh, the tools to benefit from, from uh, these new technologies. Right? When I was in a debate with uh, Senator Christopher Mbuarque, I asked him if he really thought that our uh, disciplines that uh, a poor child goes to school to learn, if he thinks those are the best disciplines to you know, enrich yourself. Like, if a poor family comes to you and says, what should I teach my son or my daughter so, you know, they don't have to live in the favela like they do? Probably you're not going to say, you know, geography, history, sociology, and political science. <laughs> Those are important disciplines. But probably you're going to say something like personal finance and, you know, understand what compound interests are. Uh, so actually, um, having different uh, uh, schools with different mindset that do not focus so much on, if, if you really think about it, on like Marxian education. Because when you teach them sociology and geography, you're teaching them to have, you know, to acquire a uh, class conscience. But you're teaching them to become more bourgeoisie, like you teach them how uh, to develop the tools that the people before them developed so they could uh, grow in wealth. So, the second uh, point about technology is something that Clay Shirky, a uh, uh, professor at NYU, calls cognitive surplus. So, um, because internet kind of reduces uh, what we call productive labor, um, we have more time to dedicate to more meaningful activities. And Shirky says that when um, the daily labor starts to decrease in England, that people start to have more free time, they did not know what to do about it. Uh, what do I do with all this free time that I now have? So, you know, one option is, well, I'm going to drink, right? <laughs> so, uh, there were problems with uh, gene consumption in, in England in the beginning of the 20th century. <laughs> and Turkey says that one of the things that uh, avoided this uh, uh, disease, this, this ill to, to go to another generation, was entertainment you start to have uh, more entertainment industries because now people had more time to spend on uh, books and novels and then on cinema and movies and television. And Shirk says that uh, television consumption has increased year after year ever since television was created until the early 2000s. That's when television consumption started to decrease. So people spend less time watching television and they start to spend more time on the internet. And the difference is that television is usually a passive way of entertaining yourself. You just sit there and you watch something. But on the internet, you're actually creating something. So you're usually taking part of a conversation. Right? If you go to uh, Reddit or Lost TV or something, you're going to see that for many of the TV series, uh, more pe people spend more time talking about them and discussing them than actually watching them. Um, and one thing that Sharpie did was that he saw how much time was needed to create uh, Wikipedia. And he saw that with the amount of time that Americans spend watching television in one year, you could create 2,000 Wikipedias. And he said, well, now we have much more free time than we can spend in activities that are meaningful to us and that are enriching to others too, instead of just being passive. So that means also we have a new conversation going. And this is very important because when conversation changes, things change as well. Um, so one of the things that um, Deirdre McCloskey, the, the economist that used to be done as Eddie was talking about uh, uh, Charles D and, and Bradley, um, one of the things that she points out is how rhetoric has changed Europe, right? How people talk about the bourgeoisie and investments and private activities that changes people's mindset. It's very similar to what Israel Kirchner, Kirchner talk, uh, thinks about entrepreneurship. Right? It's like a, a psychological switch that keeps you alert for other opportunities. But conversation also changes the way we think about politics and we think about ourselves too. So one of the reasons that um, many people agree that philosophy bloomed in ancient Greece is because the Greeks, the Greek cities had some kind of, of democracy, even if it was limited to like 30% or 10% of the population. 
but you still you started to take to make decisions that involved convincing others, and that changed the way that people talked about themselves, right? Um, so if if you if I ask you guys like why did you choose to come dressed as you are, uh, probably you don't have a, a rationale for this. Like yeah, I just like this. I just picked this up. I don't know. Uh, but if you were to vote on how we should dress for going out after, probably you need some kind of public justification, right? Probably you need to create some kind of reasoning that would be universally applied uh, to, to all of you. And this is how political philosophy started to develop. This is how this this is why Socrates was also a political figure, right? Because he was concerned about how uh, those who could manipulate uh, opinion and discourse uh, had power, and that's one of his criticisms of, of democracy. And now we have this conversation going, and some values that used to be personal and did not need to be justified now are public and need to be justified. So now everyone on Facebook, well, maybe not everyone, but most people on Facebook probably have to say what kind of political position they have, what kind of political leaning they if they're a libertarian, liberals, a conservative. And that changes things, because now you have to also justify yourself to others, right? Like, you cannot just say, well, why are you conservative? Well, because, you know, my grandfather was conservative. It's like, well, that doesn't make sense. Right? You need some kind of universal justification. And that increases demand exactly for the kind of activities that Mises Institute and Northern Libre and Millennium and Chico uh, Liberdade do, right? They are offering uh, all justifications for certain political positions. So new young people, when, when you know they go online and they have to choose something that they never thought about it, now there's a reason why they should think about this. Not only because they have to vote, but also because they have to express themselves towards others that visit their Facebook profile. And this changes the conversation. This creates like a new agro. Um, so the way that this new conversation uh, takes us also shapes the kind of divisions, political divisions we have in, in our uh, modern society. And some of this change, I think, is positive, right? Um, so if you take a look at um, Stephen Pinker's uh, Better Angels of Our Nature, his, his latest book on violence, uh, he shows some, some data on, on why uh, violence has declined, and he shows that one of the things that has happened in the past uh, three, four hundred years is that you have more empathy. Right? And this was developed mainly because of literature. So one thing that the internet creates with this new conversation is that people also start to have, sometimes, not always, but they start to have more empathy because they can uh, put themselves in the place of others more often than they usually did. Right? When you're just talking among your buddies, you're just seeing things from their point of view. But now the internet, you have to start seeing things from the point of view of millions of people of unknown people that you know just provoke you or just uh, uh, walk and talk to you. I also think that this new conversation produces more, uh, because of more empathy, more tolerance and, and more uh, cosmopolitanism. Um, so there's some evidence that people who live in cities where they have to interact with more immigrants become more tolerant and more open to uh, accepting foreigners. Right? Like, if you live in a uh, Probably in, in, in northern England, you think of you know you think of Turkish people as being some kind of like just Muslim terrorists. But if you live in, in, in London and you're surrounded by, by Turkish people, if you live in Berlin, then you know them. And you know that they're not you know just what you see on TV. You're you know people that you relate to on a daily basis. Um, and this changes also how how people behave towards others, right? So this could be a significant change as well. And also, uh, usually the internet also fosters more uh, entrepreneurship. Because now you have more channels to promote your ideas and to get benefit from them. So we have all kinds of uh, crowdfunding, but we also have some kinds of private charity that could be, you know, uh, uh, that can benefit from the interaction of most of the people. Right? And then you, you have, so if you think of, of uh, things like Kiva, you have empathy because you have to put yourself in the place of this other entrepreneur who's probably not from your country, but you also want to help him not 
through just like government handouts, but through increasing his uh, capacity to, to uh, open his or, or her own business. So there's also some dangers. Um, and the first of them is uh, internet produces more confirmation bias because you have so much data that you can just cherry pick whatever suits you, right? And this is something that we also see in, in experience. Uh, people who have preconceived notions and are given large amount of data tend to reject the data that uh, contradicts their, their assumptions and favor the data that, you know, confirms their assumptions. So you have, sometimes you give like the same information for people who are pro and against uh, gun control and then for some reason they, you know, it is pretty much like uh, uh, balance the, the pro and against claims. For some reason they think that the against claims, if you are uh, pro gun control, are bad, they're just uh, and a doctor, but you think that the other one is strong and supports your view. The other problem is that you can have, and this is derived from the first point, uh, you have what some people call epistemological closure, which means you do not seek for source of knowledge outside of your own little group. So you can close yourself in your niche and you can get, you know, if, if you're like an American right finger, you can get all your information from Fox News, and if you're American Liberal, you can get all your information from Stuart and, and, and Colbert. And, and you really uh, don't have to sometimes interact that much because you find your niche and you're very comfortable in your own beautiful little bubble. Um, but that might mean that uh, if you have preconceived notions, you're not going to change your mind because you're always going to have your little group to appeal to. And finally, there's a, the problem of uh, the fatal conceit that big data might generate, right? Because if you have a lot of data, then you can change that data, right? There's a, um, a story that uh, Hong Kong did not gather data on economic growth for a while, and when they asked the, the administration there, they said, well, if we still have numbers, there are going to be people who want to manipulate these numbers, and things are going well, so let's just not look at the numbers. So sometimes data can be a problem, because you're going to have technocrats are always going to try to manipulate data. The internet generates a lot of data. Because now, if you have an Android or an iPhone in your pocket, there's, you're sending data, you're sending information to Google or Apple about your location, about your behavior, and this is always increasing. So you also can have a more uh, uh, Skinnerian island or of sorts where you can try to manipulate each, each people's behavior according to your, your plan. And finally, uh, internet also changes institutions. And this is uh, one of the, the, the most important and, and things that we, we have to discuss and understand. How and what's the interaction between technologies and institutions? So, um, one thing that um, separates some anarchists from other anarchists is that some anarchists believe that technology matters. So, if you have a society where no one knows how to read, probably you're not going to have a contract-based society. Because contract needs, you know, writing and needs at least uh, language. If you don't have um, physical demarcations, it's harder for you to have private property. If you don't have fences or if you don't have ways to separate what's mine and what's yours, it's harder to enforce uh, uh, property laws. So, technology can change the way that we uh, deal with one another and the way that our legislation deals with uh, society. And different institutions can emerge and fall according to what technology allows us to do. And this is uh, extremely important in our days because um, although we are moving towards a more digital world, we still have a more analogical state and this discrepancy can create conflict, but can also create uh, freedom. So for instance, let's also start from the, the bottom point, smart property, which I think is something amazing. Um, Nick Sabo, uh, a professor from George Washington, if I'm not mistaken, and some people thought that he was uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, the Bitcoin creator, but he has uh, papers on smart property that I think are uh, beautiful, uh, beautiful ideas. Right? Maybe you can have property that does, that, uh, which enforcement does not depend on a coercive authority. Right? So uh, Bitcoin kind of 
kind of problems is that too. If you can have a contract that enforces itself, or if you can have some kind of, of uh, uh, property that can be transferred without depending on uh, any kind of public recognition, or just because you're changing data, just because you're changing uh, uh, information, then you actually change who can and cannot have access to property. That can be an amazing transformation. So one of the things that I'm excited about Bitcoin is not only because it can replace uh, uh, currency, but also because it can create scarcity in a means where previously this was impossible. Right? Because the, the, the digital world was, uh, by definition, somewhere where it could, could always replicate any kind of information. But now Bitcoin doesn't allow that, and so it's like fences. It kind of creates new ways to define property and to create markets where there were none before. Uh, also, geographical jurisdiction. Governments are, um, they have uh, boundaries that are geographical, and if you can avoid this boundary, but the government can't, then you can escape conference. Right? So we, we have that with uh, 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 tax wars, right? countries that try to, to attract a, a foreign wealth to, to their own uh, borders. But you also have that in a much more extended way with the internet. If our government tries to stop you from, from access to certain content, uh, it's easier, I'm not saying it's always possible, but it's generally easier to access content uh, because of the internet than without the internet, right? So South Korea, for instance, has uh, legislation on maps that they have to be approved by the, the, the military and Google Street View wasn't approved. I don't know if now it is, but it, it used to, to be forbidden for you to access Google Street View from Seoul. But people did that because they just used proxy or VPN or some kind of access and navigate around their own city. And the government couldn't do anything to, to prevent that. I mean, maybe it could, but it was very costly, right? Um, also, uh, markets become harder to define because of the digital age. So for instance, um, how, what is the market where Google operates? If you're an Austrian, you probably already uh, believe that the way you define a market is always going to be a little subjective. But this is becoming clearer for everyone now, I guess. Because if you define Google as a search engine, then you can say, well, Google, Google is a monopoly, right? They have like 80% of, of all search traffic, uh, much bigger than their, the two main competitors, Yahoo and, and Bing. But Google can say, well, we're not a search company, we are an advertising company, that's how we get our revenue. And within the advertising market of the United States, we are a fraction, we're not that much. Or you can call Google a technological company, and then within the whole technological market of the United States and the world, then Google is a smaller and smaller player. So how you define a market uh, changes because of technology. And that can change not only how we see economically the activity of a company, but also how political influence, uh, how much political influence they have. Right? One of the things that we have been seeing uh, lately is that companies that operate with the same boundaries that old companies operate are usually um, uh, victims of breathtaking activities. But those who escape those boundaries are harder to target. So if you have something like Netflix, which uh, derives its, its revenue from uh, subscribers and offer video content, then cable subscribers can say, well, they do exactly what we do, let's you know, pursue them. But you have something like uh, uh, YouTube, which uh, revenue is so much different from traditional television, then it's harder for you to try to say, well, they are our competitor. Are they really? Or think about, you know, like toys, <laughs> that uh, have these new com competitors from in, in iPads who derive the revenue not from uh, paying users but from advertisements. <coughs> so different sources of revenue change also how companies behave to new companies. Newcomers and incumbents don't have the same ways to do rent-seeking activities as they did before. And this is, is a, a major transformation. And uh, taxing and, and regulation, right? It, the it's easy for, for the state to tax you when you buy an iPad or, or a, a cell phone. It's hard for the state to tax you by 
that marginal YouTube video you watch, right? In the in the internet, it's harder for you to tax uh, activities we, we 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 do online. It's easy to tax hardware. It's harder to tax software. So government regulation in uh, in software and in, on the internet is usually not as powerful as it is in the physical world, and this also changes our institutions. So. Um, one of the hopes is that because the government is so inefficient in dealing with these new technologies is that we're going to see the success of simple rules and maybe other governments will try to adopt them and hopefully this is going to be for the benefit of, of uh, human freedom. Because when you have worlds that are so complex where it's very hard for you to draw analogies between firms and competition and political activities then it's much harder for the government to create rules. It has to create more and more targeted rules, but you can always escape those rules. Um, so either the government falls back on heuristics and just general rules that are broadly applied, or the government will try to infinitely persecute these uh, small goals. Um, I think we're talking about, about net neutrality, and, and it's one of these problems, because um, although you have uh, usually almost government-granted monopolies for some uh, ISPs and that makes it, them easy to control. But when you have uh, data exchange going online, then it's much harder for you to track exactly where the data is going to and, 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 and coming from. And especially when you have cryptography that is also privacy biased, so it's easy for you to build cryptography than it is for you to break the cryptography, that changed the game. And that changed the game in, in our uh, favor. Um, so you can think of, uh, for instance, Facebook, who might be, you know, the government probably is going to request, and it already does now, Brazil is actually the second government that requests the most information from Google. Um, but if this, this information is uh, sealed from, from government, or if it's very costly for you to break to actually understand the information, and you have to break a lot and a lot of noise, then it's much more costly for you to impose some certain regulations on um, our behavior online. And I think this can be actually a, a I, I, I envision that this is going to be extended in the future. For instance, Facebook now is worried about WhatsApp because government um, wants uh, Facebook to cooperate with investigations, but Facebook does not keep information that you exchange with your friends on, on WhatsApp. So what the government can do is that they can, uh, if they want to have information about someone else, they can ask Facebook to collect information from that specific person, but they cannot collect previous information that they exchanged between, uh, uh, among the different people. And if Facebook for some reason wants to uh, create, or if we do create some kind of cryptography enhanced uh, uh, WhatsApp or any, any other sort of instant messaging, then it's much harder for government to break, right? So you create some kind of barriers that we didn't have before. Uh, we have new tools to fight uh, control. So hopefully, hopefully this will make a government fall back into uh, simpler rules. And finally, just uh, to, to leave you guys with a question about the coming technological changes. Right? There's at least two visions of what, uh, how technology and politics interact. One is frontier, is that technology is always moving towards a frontier that and is always trying to escape uh, government. But the problem with frontiers is that they usually end at some point, right? You try to create more costs, but as a government keeps breaking those costs, at one point you don't have anywhere else to go. The other one is the Hydra uh, vision, which means whenever the government tries to, you know, uh, control a specific part of technology, then you have a burst of other technologies. Something like happened with uh, uh, the music uh, business. Right? You have you had Napster, but then government sponsors Napster. Then you had uh, Kazaa, and uh, I even forgot LimeWire. And now we have torrents, and it's becoming harder and harder for government to control. Some people believe that this is what's happening with uh, Bitcoin as well. Right? As problems are appear in, in, in Bitcoin uh, protocol, then you have new decentralized solutions. Uh, that's the vision that uh, Nassim Taleb calls uh, anti-fragile, right? So when you have shocks against a specific technology, it actually makes the technology stronger because it creates uh, uh, 
more mechanisms to to deal with uh, flaws and, and future shocks. So this is one of our hopes that technology can work as a hydra and as uh, human control and coercion advances, we multiply the number of channels and avenues of human freedom. Thank you. To, to bypass them. But still, uh, after a while, the, the guy, the IT guy, started to, to block proxy websites and he started uh, blocking the uh, web search and Google for proxy, the keyword par proxy. And what I did was simply uh, write proxy without the O letter. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> So uh, when, I, when I search that, Google would say, ah, you mean, did you mean proxy? And all the web searches were there, like all the proxies websites. And there's an infinite. Like if you go to the 20th uh, page on Google, there, there will be a proxy website. There, 
there's no way the IT guy from the school uh, would manually put all of the websites that you can bypass a restriction. There's a limit. Like, it's a human control. Like, there's, yeah. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it it's, it's much more costly for them to control than it is for you to, to yeah. bypass their control. And I, I guess the music industry was the same until they gave up. Uh, the, the, the entertainment industry in general is, is, is yeah, well, like, like that now. If, if you take an example, uh, like with the torrent, uh, in, here in Brazil we don't get arrested for downloading this. Uh, uh, like yeah. Sure. yeah, yeah. But uh, I've seen in the United States, I don't know if Patrick can can confirm it, uh, you, you can get in jail for downloading uh, illegal content by torrent. Do they track your IP or something? Do you know about that? No, I mean people they get can. Yeah. Get I've from seen some stories in Germany. Yeah, but one thing that came up then was uh, torrent with uh, um, yeah. cryptographed uh, torrent. It's a bit slower, but it it still works, right? So uh, recently I went to uh, Torrent websites and there was an option for you to download uh, uh, BitTorrent uh, client that was uh, cryptographed uh, that would download cryptographed uh, through a cryptographed uh, network. So uh, there's no way that you can, you can track people like it's natural. But, yeah. but you just show also that uh, it becomes so difficult that only guys that are experts like you can do it. Yeah. No, uh, <laughs> let, let me take you, uh, let me make you a, an, an example. VPN. Uh, in a, in a, in a... <laughs> What's a VPN? Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. Okay. Seriously, like, there's a whole point. I know, I'm not, like, not, not, not a geek. Point. It's a virtual private network that I <laughs> 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 Some server okay. and, and let me explain something. Uh, what, what is what is uh, how do you by, bypass by a proxy? What you do is like I can uh, access Google, but there's some guy in my country that can access Google, and I have access to his website. And what I do, I request uh, Google website to his server, so he downloads Google information. And passes it to me. I'm not accept, uh, I'm not uh, uh, going to Google directly. He downloads for me and then passes for me. Okay. So a VPN uh, didn't have any tools. Uh, some geeks would do in the terminal, like those black, black and white screens, and they would type and blah blah blah. blah. And now you have some very user friendly tools that. Everyone can use like yeah. a tour. Browser browser. stations now but that are featured on like Google Play Store. Hey, just download Hola or MIDI Hint. Yeah, and Hola. Just click yeah. Button and, yeah. So uh, anyone can download Tor browser. It's available, and then you, you just click uh, start, and he will open the browser, and you can surf uh, well. And even a person who, who is completely uh, oblivious to this still benefits. Think about think about like Spotify or or, or Netflix. Which uh, everyone can can use them, but they only appeared because of you know geeks or whatever that uh, bypassed them until it became uh, uh, interesting for them to yeah exactly to to make those content available. Yeah. I mean, I, I get where you're coming from, and I and I'm I am glad that one of the side effects of uh, Snowden's exposure of the NSA has been almost an arms race as far as cryptography is concerned, that you do have um, hacktivists, I guess we would call them, who are racing to not only make their cryptography a lot stronger, but also to democratize it in a sense where even a, a, you know, an, an e-targeted user like myself can probably uh, use such a thing by just simply clicking a couple of buttons and yes, now I do have a really strong cryptography thing. I mean, I might, I might not know how the hell the thing works, yeah. but as long as it does work, I mean, that's cool. So, I mean, that's where, that's where I'm definitely coming from. I'm, I, I'm really not the most savvy kind of tech guy, really, but I mean, I would really love to know more about cryptography, how to safely send emails, or how to safely have uh, FaceTime or Skype or, or some sort of 
interactive kind of thing, but without having the NSA snoop in on it, because especially when I go back to the States, that would come really in handy, so. Um, I don't know, if anybody wants to give me a crash course on that, <laughs> really great. Yeah, you have you have uh, entrepreneurial uh, opportunities for that, right? For for people to develop uh, ways that are easy and user friendly, or for people to protect themselves. Uh, we saw that at the and We saw uh, how uh, Mozilla and Google and Apple uh, thought that well, if people stop trusting the internet, that harms us, uh, and we don't want that. So it's in their self interest to to help us to you know bypass that kind of control. Well, so do you believe the market will find its way? I mean, uh, Firebase, I think, is the best example of that because they put it host on the third party and they cannot go there. They try to use drones, they try to buy sea lands. They, okay, they serve jail, but that happens. But they run away to Cambodia, to Laos, and there's absolutely nothing USA can do to stop our space. And even they change the website, the domain, almost monthly. Do you believe people and enterprises and the market will find its way to bypass that law? Yeah, uh, what I'm saying is that it's biased towards freedom, so it's very costly for you to, to enforce some kind of laws. So, for instance, our government saw the opportunity to try to uh, nationalize our internet, right? have uh, all servers in Brazil. Uh, would that be technologically possible? Yes. But politically possible uh, and economically possible, maybe not so much. So uh, Facebook and Google and, and Motorola as part of Google and Apple um, opened uh, offices in Brasilia in the past couple of years to fight that law. Um, so that's like the, the market self-interest uh, at work right there, right? because it would be so costly for them to store all their data here in Brazil. Um, I think Facebook was trying to estimate the cost of like 8 million a, a year just to uh, uh, keep the servers going, just main maintenance, because it's very hot in Brazil, um, and you have to refrigerate them. But um, So that's, that's self-interest in working in, in our favor, right? Those companies start to fight the fight uh, in either of us. And as I'm saying, uh, for you to have means of controlling something like Pirate Bay, you would have to take drastic measures that are becoming less and less plausible. Um, also, in, in uh, response to the uh, Snowden revelations, because I know Brazil uh, was targeted quite extensively for that, especially with uh, Petrobras negotiations. So we got the uh, the internet constitution, but I was also hearing about the possibility of them laying direct internet cables from Brazil to Portugal and also possibly from Brazil to South Africa to kind of bypass server, you know, going through U.S. servers entirely. Is that, uh, have you heard anything about that or is that plausible or is that, yeah, will that even help at all if they try to do something like that? I think, I think that this was, it was part of, well, Dilma at least uh, mentioned this when, when she, just thought that she could became, become the like anti-US Spanish hero. Um, but but that, that fell with, with her original plan. I don't know exactly uh, at what point. I was trying to follow the legislation. Um, so so I, I do remember when uh, Facebook and others were opposing uh, these costly measures that she was, uh, she was trying to, to, to take because uh, all these cables would go through like Brazilian servers. So you, you'd have, you know, the a physical firewall, I guess. Um, so that, that didn't go through, uh, especially because of, of private interests. Uh, which was, if, if, you, if you look at our legislation, Marco Civil, how it started and how it ended, that was like such a relief because so many bad things got dropped uh, uh, yeah. through the way. Um, if, if you think of, well, now they, they do have to keep our metadata about like IP, And, and time that we logged into a, what they call an internet application, which is very broad in general and vague. Uh, but it used to be worse because they wanted ISPs to keep that information, which means they would have both the, the IP data of all the websites that you, you access, but they also have 
their client data, so they know exactly who you are, who was using that IP. So those kind of, of, of measures were, were, were broken during the way, and, and we end up with still, uh, I think, a, a, a very harmful law, but it, it could be much worse. Now, sometimes you have interest that doesn't work in our favor, so why do, do we have this uh, uh, legislation that allows people to, <coughs> with much more ease than before, to remove content online? Well, that's especially because who has to remove content online is usually government officials, right? Google um, says that they have complied with, um, I think, 46, maybe 46% 46 of uh, government requests from Brazil. And they don't name names, but they say some requests that came from the Brazilian government that they did not, did not comply. One of them was uh, some uh, local politician who asked to remove over, I think, 180 blog posts and, and Google searches that um, had content incriminating him in the case of corruption. Uh, so, th and this, I think, is the most harmful piece of legislation because they say, well, not only that you can request to, to take that information off the, the, the website, but Google tried to fight that, and it was almost 50-50 that they won or lost, but now they increased the, the fine, so if Google fights and loses, it can pay up to 10% of their gross revenues in Brazil. So probably Google will not you know, fight that much, will probably comply much more than before, and I think that is one of the, the most harmful side effects of this legislation. Just, just one quick comment. Uh, uh, they, you mentioned that they uh, segregated what the ISP uh, has to collect uh, because they have the user data and the connection time and the IP. And then they said you cannot uh, 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 store the site data. And they went to the sites and said you have to collect the connection data and, and, and the IP. So what they're saying is that the government can have all the information they want because they can cross-check and, and know everything, mm -hmm. but not the ISP. That's, it's forbidden from having that, but the government has it all the time. So I, I, don't, I don't see that as very good news. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I, I understand. It, it's more costly. It, you can, it's easier to bypass now if, if you are one of our geeks, but uh, it, it's, still, it's still harmful. And if government really wants, they can still uh, find you and, and, and get the information on you. So yeah, I agree. Also, the time with this is, low, is now six months. It used to be one year. So yeah, six months less of data storage. Um, you know, we're we're just it's very marginal victories. I, I know. Uh, with the amount of dangers that the government, worldwide governments, are facing uh, to control the internet and our money with Bitcoin and things like that, and the NSA, don't you? I believe that it's more possible now. I'm not saying that's a great possibility, but there, if there is a possibility for a dystopian future where they have to control, shut, it, shut everything down so that we don't run away from that. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, that's, that's, that's why I think it's, it's, it's possible, but I think it's less likely. So I think was, uh, if you see the ways that uh, ancient governments used to uh, control money, um, because it was physical, they could just stamp money, and it was easier to detect um, the the kind of private replication of money. So I think it's becoming harder and harder. So yes, although uh, as a system, the system is more fragile. If the government just wants to detonate it, it's everyone's going to be much more harmed than if it was uh, previous technologies. But uh, what I'm saying is that I think it's it's more costly for the government to do that. And now if the government wants to, to shut down part of technology, you still have other means of, of uh, going around it. I think with Bitcoin, we're going to see that more and more. As the government tries to control, we're going to see what kind of different uh, uh, solutions people come up with. One of the, the more uh, talked about dangers of Bitcoin was the 51% attack if uh, a mining uh, a cluster of people uh, had uh, a majority of, of Bitcoin mining, they could uh, pretty much hack the system, they could do uh, uh, double transfers. And one of the things that, that uh, happened when that threat became closer to my door not happening, 
was that people would start to develop P2P technologies that would have a, a different kind of mining uh, format. So those are solutions that I think are, are amazing how uh, human uh, imagination comes up and, and uh, with self-interest comes up with alternatives uh, in that hydra effect. Right? So you, you escape horizontally from, from control and you make it harder next time. Thank you, Joe, I think uh, for today it is that because